This vastly improved third generation version of Kia Sorento is efficient, smart and more spacious for families seeking practical seven seat all wheel drive transport. More interesting than an MPV and roomier than a CRV or RAV4 style soft roader, you can see why it might appeal. Let's say you want a decently sized SUV for family duties. A compact RAV4 style soft roader is too small. A bigger full-size Discovery or Land Cruiser class model too large and expensive. No, potentially what you want is something like this. Kia's third generation Sorento. This car, along with its Hyundai Santa Fe cousin, has long offered this kind of appealing compromise for family SUV buyers in search of spacious, affordable seven-seat versatility. Traditionally, its buying proposition has always been that for not much more than RAV4 or CRV money, you can get three rows of seats, extra capability and better value for money. Job done. Except that it wasn't. Even in its more polished second generation guys, the Sorento felt a touch utilitarian. And for longer journeys, the truth was that it could only really seat seven if the last two members of your party were of junior school age. In developing the Mark III version then, Kia's clear objectives were to make this car a little larger, as well as making it a little more upmarket. If it could do that without dramatically affecting this model's biggest selling point, its value pricing proposition, then opportunities for sales growth looked certain. And that's exactly what the South Korean maker claims to have delivered here. A model launched in the spring of 2015 that's supposed to provide nearly everything that you get from a large segment European badged SUV rival costing over 50% more. And a car that marks the next stage of Kia's intended transformation from value brand to premium quality car maker. Hence the fresh technology, the extra efficiency and the greater depth of engineering, refinement and quality. Sounds promising, doesn't it? time to put this Kia to the test. By its own admission, Kia has never overly prioritised rewarding driving dynamics when it comes to this, its flagship Sorento model. Typical customers, the brand has always pointed out, generally enter the family SUV segment looking for a robust, comfortable and refined driving experience rather than a memorable one. Times are changing though and the company now wants to prove itself the equal of European competitors, which means upping its game when it comes to ride and handling. There's only so much that Kia's development engineers can do in this regard though, at least in this case anyway. A root and branch change in Sorento philosophy would have been necessary to make this third generation model a dynamic match for large SUVs like BMW's X5 or even Land Rover's Discovery Sport. And that's not what's been provided in the evolutionary approach delivered here. The South Korean company has to consider its more conservative US and Asian markets and in any case the brand is well aware that many potential buyers still want to tow and uh, enjoy at least the occasional light off-road adventures. In other words, they still need this car to be quite tough and that means quite heavy. To be specific, it's just under 1.9 tonnes in weight, bulk that you'll certainly feel if, rather ill-advisedly, you attempt to start throwing the thing around. To be fair, extra torsional rigidity has helped to reduce body roll around the bends and there's certainly nothing wrong with grip and cornering traction by the standards of this kind of car. Opt for the six-speed automatic transmission rather than the six-speed manual gearbox that I'm trying here and you even get a drive mode select system that can sharpen up the steering and the gear shift timings for a sportier feel. Approach a drive in a Sorento with this kind of mindset though and you're really rather missing the point. Anyway, selecting the automatic model means that your towing capacity will be reduced from 2,500 kilos to 2,000 kilos, which is a significant factor for some owners. Better instead to relax and waft happily along on the wave of torque delivered by the slightly uprated 197 brake horsepower 2.2 litre CRDI diesel engine, the only unit on offer to Sorento buyers in this country. 
pulling power is certainly in plentiful supply. The 441 newton meters on offer here, easing you from rest to 62 miles an hour in around nine seconds on the way to an academic maximum of 124 miles an hour. Also impressive is a much improved refinement of this third generation model, something Kia thinks is indicative of premium quality. Hence that extra body rigidity, the sleeker shape, the vast sways of aerodynamic shielding beneath the car, these measures together cutting noise levels by around 6%. That still isn't quite enough for full executive segment silence. The large tyres and door mirrors see to that, but it does deliver a big improvement. And off-road ability? Well, that ought to be a little better than before, despite the fact that approach and departure angles are a little down on those of the previous model, and the ground clearance remains modest at 185mm. This is because the old second generation Sorento's intelligent all-wheel drive system has been replaced by a much better Dynamax setup that this time around is actually quite intelligent. This Kia still doesn't run in 4x4 form all the time, that wouldn't be very efficient. It is now though readier to cope when conditions turn nasty. So where previously this car's four-wheel drive system clicked in only when you were already losing grip, the Dynamax setup is intuitive enough to anticipate when all-wheel drive will be needed and provide the extra traction ahead of time, which will probably be all you'll need to keep mobile in the next snowy snap or to take on the nearest forest trail. Those brave or foolhardy enough to want to do a bit more than that will be reassured by the provision of a manually selectable lock mode that splits torque 50-50 front to rear to ease you through particularly slippery situations at speeds of up to 25 miles an hour. This Kia's relatively close proximity to the ground means that these shouldn't be too extreme, but hill start assist control and a 16.9 degree approach angle should go you up reasonably steep slopes, while there's a 21.0 degree departure angle to help when you get to the bottom at the other side. It's hard to imagine any buyer of this Kia driving to those extremes. Users wanting serious off-piste stability would be more likely to buy a Mitsubishi Shogun or stretch up to a Toyota Land Cruiser or something with a Land Rover badge. Still, a Sorento owner wouldn't need to venture into the Serengeti to derive some benefit from the Dynamax 4x4 setup. We do, after all, live in a country where, on average, it rains on over 140 days each year. And on wet tarmac, this car certainly offers a reassuring feeling of traction when the weather turns bad. That's aided by a clever ATCC advanced traction cornering control system that through the turns intelligently apportions engine torque to the wheels that can best use it. When a car maker describes the design of its vehicle as dignity wrapped up in a solid package, then you've a pretty good idea of what to expect from the model in question. Kia may aspire to be seen as a premium brand, but for the time being at least, it doesn't want to produce the kind of sporty, lower slung, more dynamic looking large SUV that posh European makers like to offer. And there's a reason for that, of course, and it lies in the fact that over half of this model's sales volume comes from American and Asian markets, and they like their big 4x4s to be bluff, practical and boxy. So that's what's once more been delivered with this third generation Sorento model. All to a point it has anyway. Aware that European folk prefer something a little more arresting, Kia's design studios in Korea, Frankfurt and California have collaborated to try to deliver the necessarily squarical shape with more of a sleeker, swept back profile. The object here was not only extra showroom presence, but the need to disguise what is probably this Mark III model's biggest change, its greater size. This, we're promised, is now something that nearly all its direct competitors struggle to be, a proper seven-seater, as opposed to merely being a five-seat SUV with a couple of fold-out seats for kids in the boot. The distinction might sound subtle, but it's nonetheless important. A Sorento able to properly swallow seven fully-sized folk on a regular basis would have a key advantage over most directly comparable rivals and for the first time would be a credible alternative to a comparably priced large MPV people carrier. Hence this car's significant 95mm increase in length, nearly all of which, as we'll see, has been translated into extra interior space. 
As for aesthetics, well, as promised, the extra bulk isn't immediately evident on first acquaintance with this car. The sleeker front end helps with the long bonnet flowing into a more prominent chrome-framed interpretation of Kia's usual tiger nose front grille, featuring a distinctive three-dimensional diamond pattern and flanked by stretched wraparound headlamp units and more prominent recessed fog lights. Below these, a silver skid plate beneath the lower air intake attempts to emphasise a few SUV credentials. Move to the side and, as promised, the lower roof, the rising belt line, the more pronounced rear shoulders and a more sweeping profile do combine to make this car look a little bolder and more muscular than before. Don't get us wrong, it's still smartly practical rather than fashionably trendy, but at least now the finished product is more golf club than Gymkhana. We like the little touches too, like the way these wrap over doors hide the sills and prevent you from cleaning them with your trousers when you get out. Here's another nice touch, the smart tailgate you get on plusher variants like this one. Stand within one metre of the car with the key in your pocket or a handbag and it'll open automatically after three seconds and can be set to raise to different heights. Now, while we're at the rear, I'll highlight this sculpted registration plate housing made possible by the more accurate laser welding technologies that Kia now uses, hence the narrower, more premium panel gaps. That's a feeling that'll be further emphasised, Kia hopes, by features like this shark's fin antenna, the integral rear spoiler and the dual-like LED rear lights that you'll find on most versions. Lower down, there's also another silver skid plate to finish things off. Should we take a seat at the wheel? That's what designers from European premium brands will be doing. Keen to see just how much Kia is now capable of in this, its flagship model. The slightly lower hip point makes it easy to get in, particularly for older folk. But once inside, I should start by observing that there's nothing here that's going to give those posh German makers too many sleepless nights. That said, there's also no doubt that a huge step forward has been made over what went before. What was previously quite utilitarian is now quite smart, with a wraparound dash that extends into the doors and offers slick, soft-touch services, lovely satin brightwork, glossy piano black trim and controls with clear, classy graphics. Go for a plusher model like this one and you're even promised one of those trendy TFT virtual displays to replace the conventional instrument dials. In the event, much of the effect of this feature is somewhat lost as it only replaces the central speedo rather than running the whole width of the binnacle as a TFT screen would in something like a Range Rover Sport or a BMW X5. Still, the very fact that we're even citing those kind of comparisons says much about what's been achieved here. The central infotainment screen is certainly more seamlessly incorporated into the dash than it would be on an X5, and it's much larger than it was before, 7 or 8 inches on size, depending on the spec that you choose. Kia has missed a trick here, though, by not building in the iDrive controller-style functionality that top European brands favour. Here in the Sorento, you have to jab away at the thing to get the stereo, sat-nav, phone or informational functions that you want. Either that or try to master voice control functionality that, like all such systems, can sometimes be a bit hit and miss. As before, the driving position is commanding with good all-round visibility, except for that at the rear corners where the window lane tapers away quite sharply, leaving something of a blind spot. Still, with big door mirrors and rear parking sensors fitted to all models, that shouldn't create too much of an issue particularly if you can stretch to the flagship version with its 360-degree around-view monitor and smart park assist system. With the usual adjustment for seat and steering wheel, it's certainly easy to get comfortable in a cabin that, though only marginally more spacious than before, actually somehow feels much more roomy. The seats are much improved, firmer at the bottom and softer higher up for better overall comfort. Everything falls nicely to hand too, with ergonomic placing of the switch gear considerably improved and the switch is big enough to be used by gloved hands. As for practicality, well, there's this large centre console box, uh, twin cup holders with a sliding cover, a large glove box and decently sized door pockets.
Take a seat in the second row and there's also a greater feeling of space, partly because of an extra 15 millimetres of legroom, but mainly because the designers have managed to all but eliminate the previous model's chunky transmission tunnel, meaning that three passengers can much more easily be seated. Headroom still isn't overly generous, especially with this large glass panoramic roof fitted. But taller folk will be able to feel more comfortable if they're able to make use of the reclining seat backs. That glass roof's worth having too, offering this rather darkly furnished cabin a lighter, airier feel. I mentioned legroom. Uh, another welcome touch is the way you can slide this seat base backwards and forwards through 270 millimetres of travel. Although the extent to which you'll be able to do that will of course be determined by whether you're in front of third row folk travelling behind. Time to see how passengers of that sort will fare. Access to this third row would be better if this middle seat tumbled forward rather than merely sliding back and forth. Once you are in, though, there is, as the 80mm wheelbase increase promises, just about room now for the couple of full-size adults who would have been significantly more cramped in the previous generation version of this car. Don't get us wrong, the change isn't massive. The headroom increase is limited to 15 millimetres, certainly not enough to make you as comfortable as you would be in the very rear of a Galaxy or a Sharan like large people carrier. But by SUV standards, it's really quite spacious back here. You'd be noticeably more constricted in the very back of a Land Rover Discovery Sport, and even an Audi Q7 costing twice as much isn't noticeably roomier in this regard. Third row folk also get their own air conditioning vents and controls. Of course, with those rearmost seats in place, there isn't much room for luggage. But then, of course, that's true of any seven-seater that isn't directly based on a van. Lift that smart tailgate I mentioned earlier, and you'll find that with all three rows in place, you get 142 litres of cargo space, a capacity that rises to 605 litres if you tug on these bootstraps to fold the third row chairs, that last figure a 17.5% increase on before. The tonneau cover can be stored neatly away beneath the boot floor when it's not in use, although there's no room under here to store much else, thanks to Kia's welcome decision to specify all cars sold in this country with a full-size spare wheel. More capacity can be freed up, though, if you're prepared to annoy any second-row passengers by sliding the middle seats forward. And there's a useful 40-20-40 fold in the central backrest, so that longer items like skis can be pushed through between a couple of middle-row occupants. Flatten the central bench, and 1,662 litres of fresh air can be freed up, 90 litres more than before. The completely flat low bay is 47 litres bigger than the one you get in a rival Hyundai Santa Fe and 34 litres larger than that you'd have in a Land Rover Discovery Sport. Prices for this third generation Sorento start very competitively from around £29,000, although you can pay up to £41,000 for one if you opt for the flagship KX4 version. That top model comes only with automatic transmission, whilst at the opposite end of the range, the base KX1 version comes only as a manual. In between, there are KX2 and KX3 derivatives, offering the option of an auto box for a premium of around £1,800. What is common across the range is four-wheel drive and the 197 brake horsepower, 2.2-litre CRDI diesel engine beneath the bonnet. Seven-seat versatility is standard on all models too, something that rivals often make you pay extra for. On to the value proposition that pricing represents, which is actually very strong. As ever with the Sorento, Kia's argument is that with this car, you're getting all the key attributes of a large segment, seven-seat family SUV, say a full-size Land Rover Discovery or a Toyota Land Cruiser, costing £40,000 to £45,000 for the price of a compact segment, five-seat SUV, say a more powerful diesel version of Toyota's RAV4 or Honda CRV, costing £27,000 to £30,000. Despite the small price increases applied to the third generation version of this car, that still holds true here.
This car's most obvious rival is its Korean cousin, Hyundai Santa Fe, a model that shares much of the same chassis and engine technology, but costs a fraction more to run and is just under £500 pricier to buy when specified with seven seats. Mitsubishi Shogun also sells for the same kind of money Kia's asking here, but the Shogun's big drawback is it'll be 30 to 40 percent pricier to run. Still, at least you could have either the Hyundai or the Mitsubishi within this Kia's £30,000 budget. The other obvious choice in this segment, Land Rover's Discovery Sport model, will cost you significantly more. You're looking at a premium of at least around £5,000 to own one of those. And remember too that the Disco Sport is a slightly shorter car, so its third row seating will be less adult friendly. Even tighter at the rear are the only other possible options I'd pick out in this class. Mitsubishi's Outlander, Nissan's X-Trail and Sanyong's underrated Rexton W. All three models cram in three rows of chairs over all-wheel drive mechanicals and could save you around 20% on the price of a Sorento. In each case, though, what you'd really be getting is a slightly smaller car that certainly couldn't regularly take seven adults in the way that this one can. A feebler one, too, with about 25% less power. For the kind of customers who will be seriously considering this Sorento, that recipe won't be very tempting. If having considered all of that, you conclude that it is a Sorento that you really want, then with Kia's value-based market stance in mind, you're going to be expecting a decent level of standard equipment for your money. And by and large, you shouldn't be disappointed. As well as the all-wheel drive system and the seven-seat capacity that I mentioned earlier, which not all rivals offer as standard, all models feature LED daytime running lights, front fog lamps with integrated cornering lights, headlamp levelling to compensate for heavy loads, reverse parking sensors, tinted glass, alloy wheels, roof rails, a rear spoiler, power folding mirrors and nice little touches like front wiper de-ices to get you going on a cold morning. Inside there's a decent quality six-speaker stereo with DAB radio and controls on a leather-covered steering wheel, offering multi-mode adjustability so that on the move you can vary its response to your taste. There are also USB and AUX imports, plus Bluetooth connectivity for your phone, as well as air conditioning, a trip computer, cruise control with a speed limiter, a proper spare wheel and hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Do you want more? Well, adding just over £3,000 to your Sorento budget will allow your dealer to upgrade you into the plusher KX2 model, the starting point in the range for buyers wanting the option of automatic transmission and self-levelling suspension. At this level, your car will come complete with larger 18-inch wheels, satellite navigation, a reversing camera, heated part lever seats, auto headlamps and wipers and various trim embellishments. Of course, the real niceties are reserved for the top models in the range, the KX3 and KX4 variants that Kia says 28% of Sorento customers choose, and the models you'll need if you want to try some of the cleverest technology that Kia has introduced with this car. Things like the 7-inch TFT LCD colour instrument display that replaces the conventional dials and the smart tailgate that needs only to sense the presence of a key in your pocket to activate. Both these features are fitted to this well-specified KX3 variant, along with niceties like adaptive xenon headlights that turn with the bends, a panoramic sunroof, alloy pedals, a power-adjustable driver's seat, a larger 8-inch infotainment touchscreen, and an infinity premium sound system. That doesn't leave much for the top KX4 model. Only big 19-inch wheels, full leather trim, side window blinds and ventilated front seats to keep you cool in summer. Manoeuvring will be simpler thanks to a 360-degree around view monitor and a smart park assist system that can guide you into the tightest space. And there's also adaptive cruise control to vary your speed based on traffic congestion at a cruise. Key options are, well, relatively few, apart from metallic paint. They're mainly limited to practicalities like integrated side rails, roof rail crossbars and the usual cycle carriers and tow bars. Safety-wise, this car's stiffer body shell and greater use of high-strength steel boosts its protective credentials and justifies its five-star rating in NCAP tests as well as twin front side and curtain airbags, although there's no driver's knee bag, 
You also get anti-whiplash head restraints, a pedestrian-friendly active bonnet, a tyre pressure monitoring system and Isovix child seat fastenings. Electronic features carried over from the old model include ESC, electronic stability control, and VSM, vehicle stability management. The latter feature helping if, for example, uh, you're in a situation where one side of the car has more grip than the other, say when you're driving near a grass verge. Plus, the anti-lock brakes have a brake assist function to help in emergency stops. These are advertised to following motorists by an emergency stop signalling function that flashes the rear lights when you slam on the anchors. There's also a useful trailer stability assist system to make towing safer. If you want to go further, then extra safety protection is provided by the pricier variants. This KX3 model delivers a speed limit information function that pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash, and a lane departure warning system that stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. At plusher KX4 level, there's also a blind spot detection system to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake, and a rear cross traffic alert system that warns you of approaching vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. In developing this third generation Sorento model, Kia didn't have the option of completely changing the 2.2 litre CRDI diesel engine that's long been used in this car, or substantially reducing this vehicle's weight. As a result, the brand has been limited by what it can achieve in terms of significant running cost improvements. Still, significant efforts have been made. That power plant, for example, has been made lighter, more efficient and cleaner so it can meet Euro 6 standards. There's a more sophisticated fuel-saving MDPS motor-driven power steering system. All models, including the automatics, get the brand's ISG, Intelligent Stop and Go system, to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. And there's a freshly developed Dynamax all-wheel drive setup that helps to save fuel when traction isn't at a premium. As a result of all this, Kia has been able to reduce the running cost of this car by about 5% which means that it's also about 5% cheaper to operate than a rival Hyundai Santa Fe, which uses the same 2.2-litre CRDI diesel but lacks the efficiency updates I've just been talking about. Time for some running cost specifics. A manual Sorento model manages 49.5 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 149 grams per kilometre of CO2. Opt for an automatic variant and thanks to an active eco feature that adjusts the operation of the engine and transmission to promote maximum fuel economy, those figures don't take much of a hit, falling to 43.4 miles per gallon and 177 grams per kilometre. Both the readings I've just quoted you are based on those of a standard model with 17-inch wheels. As usual, opting for the larger 18 or 19-inch rims you'll have to have on plusher versions like this one will have a fractional impact on your overall returns. It's nothing to lose any sleep over, though. I should give you some perspective on those figures. It's true that they're around 10% below the kinds of returns you get from a comparable Land Rover Discovery Sport TD4 180 PS, but to be fair, this Kia is a little faster and a little bigger than that car. Otherwise, this South Korean's model's efficiency stats fully endorse Kia's decision back in 2009 to change the platform this Sorento sits on from a crude body-on-frame construction to a lighter, more car-like monocoque design. Look at the stats of rivals that haven't made that switch, cars like Mitsubishi's Shogun and Sangyong's Rexton W, and you'll find that staying with those heavier, clunkier underpinnings has made them 30 to 40 percent more expensive to run. Yes, those two competitors are better off-road as a result, but that's a big cost difference for owners to swallow. What else? Well, those of you worried about tax liability will want to know that Sorento's fall between VED band F and I and incur a company car tax liability of between 27 and 33 percent. Residuals will be important too, figures that have gradually improved as Kia's standing in the market has improved. Used values will continue to be propped up by the brand's excellent warranty arrangement, given that, unlike some other programs, it's fully transferable to second owners. It's worth pointing out, though, that the trumpeted seven-year, 100,000-mile package actually only covers the engine and gearbox. It's 100,000 miles and five years for everything else.
Insurance groupings are also reasonable, enhanced by low cost of repair and excellent safety precision. KX1 and KX2 models are rated at groups 24 and 25. This KX3 is rated at group 26 and the top KX4 model pitches in at group 28. Servicing intervals are every 20,000 miles or 12 months, whichever comes sooner. And you can keep maintenance costs down by opting for either of Kia's Care 3 all-inclusive servicing packages that provide inflation-proof servicing costs for the first three or five years of the vehicle's life. This third-generation Sorento tells us a lot about the way Kia now wants to develop as a brand. We can see from this car how the company can now match its European rivals in terms of quality and technology. And we can see from this model's pricing that the brand is still able to do this for the kind of money able to make its competitors look expensive. What the Mark III model Sorento also tells us, though, is that going forward, Kia isn't simply going to copy the more established marks for the sake of it. Specifically here, in creating this potentially quite luxurious family SUV, it wasn't prepared to compromise the honest, robust practicality that characterised previous versions of this design, merely to make this car a bit sportier. As a possible buyer, you'll either like that or you won't. As with the previous Sorento model, it's certainly true that there are trendier, more dynamic choices you could make. There are a few better all-round options, though. After all, your other segment choices generally either restrict you to five seats, or if they don't, then they provide significantly less power and space. To match what this Kia can offer, you've either got to spend far more on a European rival, or consider this car's Hyundai Santa Fe design stablemate. Buyers trying this third-generation Sorento now have a good reason not to do either of these things. This Kia's newfound extra polish and cleverness take it clear of that in-house rival and make choosing the car a more credible option for buyers who simply don't need the dynamic advantages on offer from much pricier Land Rover models, all the German brands in this segment. Plus, as ever with this model, while those familiar with the Amalfi Coast might still feel the Sorento to be lacking an R, a glance at the spec sheet doesn't immediately suggest that it's lacking much else. In short then, for all kinds of reasons, this is now a car you would like, rather than merely one that would be very handy to have. Which is why, for this South Korean maker, a new era starts right here. <laughs>